This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. My name is Helene Lipton, and I'm a professor of health policy in the Department of Clinical Pharmacy and the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies at the University of California at San Francisco. Today, it's my distinct pleasure and privilege to introduce and to interview Senator Tom Daschle. Senator Daschle is a former Democratic senator from South Dakota, and he served for many years as U.S. Senate Majority Leader. Uh, he currently is a senior policy advisor at DLA Piper, a leading national law firm. In addition to his many talents, Senator Daschle is a health policy expert. He advised President Obama on the Affordable Care Act when it was being developed and his expertise is well known in this area. So we're very lucky to have him join us today. Welcome, Senator Daschle. Thank you, Helene. It's very nice to be here. As a former Senate Majority Leader, you are a person of great pragmatism. It's a hallmark of your leadership. You believe in rolling up your sleeves and tackling the tough questions that confront our nation today. You're a champion of consensus-based solutions. But the problem is, Senator Daschle, we don't have, as you know, much in the way of consensus today in our Congress when it comes to dealing with many of our leading policy problems and challenges. What strategies do you think we need to use to overcome the current logjam in Congress so that we can move forward on the important issues facing our country, particularly in terms of today's conversation, the Affordable Care Act? Well, Helene, I'm actually encouraged that there is greater consensus around many of the health issues than oftentimes is reported in the media. There is consensus, for example, overwhelmingly, that we have a cost problem in health care, that we have an access problem, and that increasingly we have a very serious quality problem. I think there's consensus as well about what's causing some of this, the lack of transparency, too much unnecessary care driven by a fee-for-service system that rewards volume and not value, that we have too high administrative costs because we don't use health IT nearly enough, and that we have uh, little uh, coordination for chronic illness, and and unfortunately a little more fraud than, than we, sh we would like to acknowledge. All of those causes are driving uh, some of the problems we face in health care. There's a consensus as well about what kind of a health care marketplace we ought to have, a high performance, high value marketplace with greater access, better quality, and lower cost. The real division when it comes to health care between Republicans and Democrats, between conservatives and liberals, mm -hmm. often involves uh, one question, what is the proper role of government as we go forward? And so we've got to understand that problem and come up with ways with which to find compromise. I think it's going to take real leadership. It's going to take real involvement on the part of constituency groups uh, all over the country, especially here in California. And it's going to take an engaged electorate uh, that uh, will press their legislators to find common ground, not stand their ground without compromise. I think we can do that going forward. Recently, you've written about specific hurdles relating to the Affordable Care Act specific challenges. You've mentioned legislative challenges, regulatory challenges, the budgetary barriers like the looming fiscal cliff, policy challenges. 
uh, and you think these need to be addressed and addressed squarely by Congress and the President, how do you think we should deal with some of these more specific challenges in making sure that the full implementation of our nation's health care law gets realized? Well, the good news is that we're now on the field and we are in a position to reach the goal line if we uh, acknowledge that we have a lot of these challenges that have to be addressed. I would say the biggest policy challenge involves our uh, ongoing debate about uh, uh, the amount of cost related to federal health programs today. And unfortunately in the past, all too often policymakers, and I have to include myself here occasionally, we, we uh, addressed the challenges with regard to cost simply by cutting and shifting. We cut the costs at the federal level and shift them on to uh, others, on to stakeholders, on to institutions, on to the beneficiaries, on to uh, the States, providers. the providers, and we've got to all acknowledge that we can't cut and shift as we go forward. The far better alternative is to redesign and improve, to deal with the causes of the problems that we're facing, to recognize that we can create a more efficient and higher quality uh, marketplace today than we have. And I'm, I'm confident that over time that is uh, an effort that uh, is ga gaining traction. We also have to recognize that the states are going to play a very, very big role in making sure that we put the emphasis on coordinating at the state level as they build their exchanges and as we create this new paradigm for health with far greater emphasis, I might emphasize, on wellness rather than just on illness it, it is, is essential. And uh, But all of that will have to take place almost by necessity after we resolve the election. The election itself will dictate to a certain extent the direction our country takes. The two presidential candidates have starkly different positions with regard to the Affordable Care Act. So once that's resolved, uh, we can begin to uh, understand what the, 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 the lay of the land looks like and begin to address these causes and problems in a much more real way. And speaking of understanding, the Affordable Care Act, as you've written, you know, is complex. It does involve many new and exciting initiatives, programs, etc. Sometimes it can be a little confusing for many Americans to understand. So can you distill for us today, <laughs> Senator Daschle, what you see to be the major benefits of the program? Well, that's a great question, Elaine. I would say that there are three primary benefits that will come as a result of the passage of the Affordable Care Act going forward. First and foremost is this recognition of the utter importance of joining the rest of the industrialized world and having universal access to health care. I can't think of anything more fundamental than that. Is health care a right? It may not be a constitutional right, but it certainly ought to be a moral right. And universal access is something that the Affordable Care Act allows us over time uh, to achieve, not in its entirety. We still have some work to do even after the Affordable Care Act is fully implemented. Right. But nonetheless, access is critical. The second is we all recognize virtually every American is affected by costs today. Costs are enormously part of the problem today. When I was born, costs were 4% of the gross domestic product in health. When my children were born, it was 8%. When my grandchildren were born, it was 16%. And if I'm lucky enough to have great-grandchildren, they tell us it'll be 32% of GDP. That is an unsustainable path for costs that we've got to accept accept and recognize have to be addressed. And so cost is the second opportunity for us with the Affordable Care Act. And I believe we're going to make major changes with regard to our tools that the Affordable Care Act now give us to address cost in a meaningful way. The third is quality. Unfortunately, whether it's Commonwealth, one of the more authoritative organizations that have uh, reviewed quality overall as a comparative indice with other countries 
Series right. or other other organizations, uh, the United States unfortunately oftentimes comes in dead last in overall quality. We know that's unacceptable given the fact that we spend more than any other country. So quality will be a key factor as we look at ways with which to redesign the paradigm, putting greater emphasis on wellness, greater emphasis on comparative effectiveness research, greater emphasis on outcomes rather than on services. When we do that, quality will have the kind of, of, of priority that it has long deserved and never gotten in our healthcare marketplace today. And we're seeing so many benefits playing out already. For instance, Medicare beneficiaries who are enrolled in our nation's prescription drug program, Medicare Part D, they're already seeing that their coverage gap is being closed and it's going to be completely phased out by 2020. So they're already seeing savings and access to affordable medications that they need. No question. I mean, they, they, the new protections that are built in are ones that already the American people are embracing enthusiastically and will never be repealed. The opportunity for no lifetime limits, no annual limits, no pre-existing condition screening any longer, uh, the opportunity for younger people to enroll in their parents' plans, the opportunity to afford prescription drugs for seniors in ways that they never could before, all of that and much, much more more is already in place and the more people know the more people fully appreciate what a what an extraordinary advancement this is in healthcare delivery in America today given all the benefits that you've just enumerated senator dashel how do we account for the fact that so many americans still don't look favorably on the law, that it still remains unpopular. You're right, they appreciate the health insurance protection coverage a lot, but the law in general, and a key component of the law, the individual mandate, which requires people to buy their own insurance, still remain unpopular for many Americans. Well, you made a point earlier, Helene, of saying how complicated health is, and it is a very, very complicated sector of our economy with very little transparency, unfortunately. We've got to do a much better job of improving transparency, which gives people much clearer understanding of their own health data and their own circumstances. But Winston Churchill had a great quote once that I've often used uh, with regard to health, and that is that a lie gets halfway around the world before truth gets its shoes on and with technology today that's even more true and there's been a lot of misinformation about the Affordable Care Act and about its implications and about the consequences that we'll face as a result of its passage slowly but surely truth is getting its shoes on slowly but surely people are beginning to understand what it may mean for them and the more they understand the more they like the more they like the more they support the mandate is is just one illustration of that as I said earlier health care is a moral right but along with the right comes a responsibility and I've always been chagrin somewhat that people don't appreciate the fact that uh, this was never a question of whether we have a mandate. We have a mandate uh, that that is in existence today that uh, is every bit as uh, punitive as whatever mandate uh, the, Af the Affordable Care Act requires. The mandate we live under now is the mandate that we pay for those who don't. Every time we go into a hospital or a medical setting, mm -hmm. we pay for uncompensated care and we have no choice in the matter. That is is added to our bill and it amounts to over fifteen hundred dollars for, for a typical family every year mm -hmm. so that mandate exists today what we're saying is let's take uh, more of an effort make more of an effort to create individual responsibility for one's health not only in terms of how one pays but how one cares for themselves through better wellness so taking responsibility is part of this right to good health that I think every American acknowledges ultimately and so I'm hopeful that we can continue to build that understanding and and with that understanding greater consensus we had a conversation about this not too long ago and you made a point about the Medicaid program our nation's program for the poor 
and how that was implemented in 1965, but that wasn't very popular either. That's right. The Medicaid program was not uh, accepted initially by states. Only six states agreed to enroll right after its enactment. Obviously, it didn't take long for states to recognize what a valuable program it was and that uh, over time, every state finally uh, agreed to participate to the point where it's now a major part of every state budget. And I believe we will see that with the expansion of the Medicaid program as well. It's, it's too important. It's too good a deal for the states to turn away. And I believe not only for health reasons, but for economic reasons, most states, if not all states, will soon comply. So there's a good historical lesson learned. From That's us. right. We can take a lot of a lot of solace in history. <laughs> exactly. The nation's population, Senator Daschle, is aging. The baby boomers are coming of age, all 77 million of them. And some observers have noted we're witnessing nothing short of a silver tsunami. <laughs> And with increasing age comes increasing burden of multiple chronic diseases. And there are many who believe that the treatment for such chronic diseases needs to be more comprehensive and more coordinated. What do you see as the merits of a team-based approach to healthcare delivery? Because it makes a marked departure from the current status quo, which is one doctor, one patient. Well, Helene, you put your finger on the, on the operative word, and that is coordination. We don't coordinate chronic illness well at all in our country, and therein lies a single major cause for higher costs and poorer quality today. We have an extraordinary challenge in front of us with regard to improved coordination. And there is widespread realization that until we coordinate chronic illness more effectively, uh, we really won't create the results, uh, even with the Affordable Care Act, uh, that we know we can achieve with a real priority on this incredible challenge. Uh, but the team approach, whether it's accountable care organizations or medical homes or any one of a number of other opportunities, I'm an advocate of what I like to call a quality care organization that puts the emphasis on quality through coordination, quality through greater transparency, quality through meaningful teamwork and, and interrelationships and integration of all providers within a medical setting. That's not going to happen overnight, but that ought to be our aspiration as a country, and I'm confident that with the kind of attention and the realization of how much it can contribute to better outcomes, that there's going to be a, an enormous response to that uh, opportunity going forward. I'm encouraged by the recognition of the importance that this has. I'm encouraged by the enthusiasm with which the concepts are being embraced and uh, I'm therefore somewhat optimistic that we can achieve the results over a period of time. When I speak on medical homes, a lot of people think I'm talking about nursing homes. Uh, there is some confusion. Do you want to shed some light for our viewing audience about what is a medical home or an accountable care organization? Basically, I would simply call it a health headquarters. Mm -hmm. That's really what it is. It's a health headquarters. It's where it's, it's one-stop health care delivery. It's a recognition that coordination can happen if we have a central location from which most of the coordination can take place, a health headquarters. And I believe over time, given the opportunity to use the technology and health IT especially, given the enormous opportunities we have for better data management, that something I like to call citizens' health is going to be a big part of our future. What do I mean by citizens' health? I was health? just going to ask. I mean citizens' health is where citizens take more interest in their own health, knowing their circumstances, knowing and, and having access to better data regarding their own health uh, on, a, on a regular basis. I carry a cell phone like most people day, today, and I have all of my records on my cell phone. It's an 
enormous opportunity for me to check my blood pressure, to check every aspect of my health, and to, to direct dial uh, just by, by pressing my provider's name, get him on the phone or her on the phone. Uh, in a coordinated fashion, my team of health providers is on call uh, here in my cell phone. That's what I'm talking about with regard to Citizens Health and Medical Homes today, having a health headquarters. You don't only talk the talk, Senator Dasher, you walk the walk. I'm very impressed. Exactly. I'm very excited about it. Finally, I wanted to move to another hot button topic, Medicare. The Medicare program, as we know it, is not sustainable. There's increasing recognition on both sides of the aisle that there needs to be fundamental changes in the program. And in fact, Medicare reform has been a focal point of debate. What policy changes would you recommend to help make the Medicare program for our nation's elderly and disabled more accessible, not only for current beneficiaries, but of equal or more importance for future generations of Americans? Well, the first thing I would emphasize and I would assert with great uh, vigor is that you can't fix Medicare without fixing our larger health care universe. That it's impossible to isolate out Medicare and not address the larger questions. It was what I was referring to earlier when I was talking about cutting and shifting. If all we do are reduce the commitments financially to Medicare in the name of reform and shift the costs onto somebody else, we haven't solved the problem. But what we, what we need to do with regard to Medicare is what we need to do with our entire health universe. We need far better transparency. We need far better emphasis on data management. We need a lot more emphasis on uh, health IT acquisition. We're only at about 20% uh, within the, 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 the entire sector today. 80% of our sector is still paper driven. And in, therein lies a huge amount of cost, inefficiency, and, and mistakes made as a result of transcription. So we have a huge problem with regard to data management that is large, largely driven by our lack of acquisition of health IT today. We need uh, a movement away from our fee-for-service uh, system today, and Medicare is the primary example of that. The more we can move to capitated and bundled approaches in Medicare, uh, the faster we're going to be able to address this unnecessary care driven in large measure by the fee-for-service programs. And then finally, we need quality improvement. I, I would like to see every doctor uh, in an operating room be required to have a, a, uh, uh, a checklist as they go through surgical procedures. Um, but protocols and opportunities for us to improve the, the quality of delivery in hospital settings and in medical settings is really critical to improving quality. All of that needs to be done in Medicare, but coincidentally, it also has to be done in our healthcare marketplace, and therein lies our opportunity as well as the challenge that goes forward. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the move away from fee-for-service medicine. Could you walk us through how that would, that move away from fee-for-service to more capitated systems like integrated delivery systems like Kaiser, how would that affect, let's say, a, a Medicare beneficiary? What differences would he or she see on the ground? Well, I think the, the, the big difference that a Medicare beneficiary would have with a capitated system is that the emphasis would be put on that beneficiary's wellness. In other words, what happens today oftentimes before the beneficiary is in any way affected by our health care delivery mechanisms and, 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 and infrastructure is only when that person uh, shows some symptom of, Ill, of illness. And it's only after that person uh, has the symptoms and and, and has a particular illness that we engage our medical process. What I think most people recognize is that's a very costly way to address
address health care, that if we really emphasize the need to stay well and the opportunities that we have to affect wellness, uh, that we could do a lot better job of, of managing costs and improving quality simultaneously. We often associate more service with higher quality. That's no longer true. Or it's expensive services. Expensive with services quality. with higher quality. Right. Right. And so what we have to do is to change the mindset and in creating a new health environment, recognize the importance of wellness, recognize the importance of, of outcomes rather than of the number of services someone receives. And once we do that, we can create a new health payment paradigm that will match it as well. But it, you have to put the horses in order. And the first horse, of course, is to change this concept of illness to wellness. And I think over time we can do that. The capitated model has been tried in the past, right? Uh, me many Medicare beneficiaries belong to Medicare Advantage, a few million, and they're very happy with it. But the overwhelming majority have not opted into Kaiser-like systems. They still value choice. How do we move the dial to effectuate the changes that you're talking about, given that history? Well, I, I, I think that choice is important, but what we, if we look, if we take any lessons from our capitated experiences in the past, it is that in large measure they were insurance driven, not provider driven. And I think we have to make the, the collective shift uh, to, rather than just making it a payment model, making it a delivery model. Because, we, and that's what I was referring to a moment ago when I talked about getting our horses in line in the right order. Unless we make it a, a delivery driven um, experience rather than an insurance driven experience, uh, we're gonna be putting the emphasis on the wrong, uh, uh, the wrong factors involving uh, this new capitated approach. But by making it a provider driven approach, we can emphasize quality and wellness and create greater satisfaction and therefore greater trust and in greater trust greater support for the capitated approaches going forward but that's where it has to be people trust their doctors uh, they don't always trust their insurance companies and so finding a way to ensure that we put the trust where it belongs and make it more personal uh, that's the beginning we're lucky to have an opportunity to have you talk about your vision and to have you as a thought leader to help us realize that vision, Senator Daschle. Thank you so much for joining us today. You know, issues like the Affordable Care Act and Medicare reform are very complicated and complex, and you've shed enormous light on both of these very important issues, and we thank you very much for being with us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.